In this video, I'm going to show how to consume a JSON feed and show the results in a C-sharp razor page in an HTML table all the way from start to finish. We'll start with this JSON feed, which is plants that exist at the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Garden. This feed is freely available online, no API key needed. You can take a look at the GitHub repo and you can get that URL if you'd like to follow along with it. Now, this is an array of plant, or actually specimen objects, because we're representing different specimens that exist at the Cincinnati Zoo. You notice it starts with a square bracket, where square, square bracket is how we designate an array in JSON. After that, we have a repeating group of curly braces, which represent an object in JSON. So it's an array of objects. It's a little bit easier to visualize if we use a tool like jsonviewer.stack.hu or any of the other tools out there, with one caveat. We probably don't want to copy and paste the entire JSON stream. This is about 300 specimen records at the Cincinnati Zoo. But if we only get part of it, then we end up with a funny situation where we have that open square bracket and we don't have a closed square bracket. So we have to massage the data just a little bit. Let me show you what I mean. I copied, say, from here to here. And you notice I have the open square bracket and I have a series of objects. And then I have a closed cur curly and a comma. So we don't want to end with a comma. We'll take that comma off, and we also have to balance out the array so we would end it with a closed square bracket. So I did that already, and I put it into the uh, online JSON viewer, so jsonviewer.stack.hu. Once again, you see here the open square bracket, the closed square bracket, and a comma-separated list of uh, records in between that represent those specimens. So here we're still, still dealing with text that's not really easy to visualize. But here's the cool part. If we go over to Viewer, it puts this in an easy-to-read format for us, and we can see that, okay, we have a flat array, and we have a series of objects inside of that array. Each object has the same attributes, but those attributes have different values because you wouldn't have two plants at the exact same location, latitude and longitude. They're going to be a little bit different. They're going to have different names, uh, maybe different planted by, so on and so forth. But nonetheless, this makes our JSON stream easy to visualize. Now, a recommendation if you're looking at integrating JSON, this is probably the easiest way to go. When you have a simple array with a series of objects, that's easy to consume. If you end up with a lot of nesting, so you have an array that has objects in it, those objects have arrays, and those arrays have objects, and those objects have objects, and you end up with nested square bracket curlies, that gets a little more complicated. Not impossible, it's just a bit more work. So step number one when you find a JSON so source is put it in a tool like this, and if it's flat, you're good to go. If it's more convoluted, you know, look for options to read it or even look for a different data stream if you can. Now, this helps us visualize it. Let's now go to QuickType with this exact same string here. So I paste this into QuickType, and QuickType will generate a lot of things for me. I paste it in here, choose the language C-sharp. Notice there are a lot of other options like Kotlin, and I can easily switch among these. I can also just do JSON schema, which are the validation rules, or at least the start of the validation rules for this. Or I can go ahead and say C-sharp, just like so. Now, it's going to generate a class, and the default name is welcome. I have changed it to specimen, but notice if I type welcome or specimen, the source code updates dynamically, which is really handy. Also, it needs a namespace, which is a, a unique location, what I call a state, where a, a class is a city, a namespace is like a state that contains those cities. So that namespace is right here. I've chosen my plant diary. Uh, it's something else by default, but once again, you notice as I start typing my plant diary, if you take a look on the left, you'll see that it's updating the source code. Now, the cool part is this is straight up C-sharp source code, so we can simply copy and paste this right into our project. One more change. Let's change the return type from array to list. That's going to be a little bit easier to navigate as we get into our code. I will go ahead and say copy code, and now come to Visual Studio 2022 and create a new class. Inside this class, I'll go ahead and paste what I got from QuickType. Now you notice in my case, it doesn't compile right away, so we want to fix that right away as well. 
And if you take a look at the red lines, it's looking for something called Newtonsoft, which is a package that we can install and is absolutely fundamental to parsing JSON in Visual Studio. Let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to go to Project and then Manage Nugget Packages, Browse. And it's funny, even without typing in a filter, you see this is one of the most common. Let's go ahead and get this one. Now with that installed, we go back to our class and holy smokes, it's beautiful. No red lines. So we have uh, imported our quick type, which is going to allow us to go grab that JSON very easily and look at it as a series of objects. So let's continue with our example. And next we're going to take a look at our index page and see how we can make the data that we've just collected available to our index.html. Remember that the CS file is like a code behind file. And also recall that on get is what gets invoked the first time we access the page. We have some logic there from a previous lecture that I made. Let's go ahead and try to parse this JSON. It's going to be a couple steps I'm going to do in a kind of funny order. But nonetheless, let's say specimen. We had a using statement uh, because that's in a separate namespace. And now we can invoke the method from JSON. And guess what that's going to do? It's going to reach out and parse some JSON for us, but the trick is we have to give it some JSON. And so to give it some JSON, we have to go get the JSON, and we can do that by using something called HTTP client. By the way, notice I snapped and the sun went down. HTTP client allows us to do asynchronous calls over the web, and it only needs to be created once, so we can make it a static read-only variable. So I had to clear it up towards the top. Now down in our on get method, I'm going to invoke client.get async, and I'm going to grab our endpoint URL. So again, if you're following along, uh, you can just grab this from GitHub, uh, as I mentioned, freely available a, a JSON stream. Now this is an asynchronous call, which means that it's going to go do something and then we can keep running and then we'll hear back from it later. Or we can say, let's wait till we hear back from it. Well, let's go ahead and say we want to wait till we hear back from it. I can simply assign this to a task. A task is something that can be run. Then I can ask that task for its result. And let's go ahead and introduce a local variable for this result. It's going to give us back an HTTP response method. Now, we can make sure that we got a successful status code with this simple if test. Inside of this if test, we can read the string from that result. Result dot content, and then read the string async. That will give us back the string that we got back from making this web call, essentially. So let's introduce a local variable. And once again, we have a task because this is an asynchronous call, but we do want to wait for the call to complete before we finish this get method. That's not always the case, FYI. Sometimes you want to do multiple asynchronous calls at once. I'll give you a common scenario for that. You are an API that's serving a mobile client, and a lot of times mobile clients want to get everything in one big chunk of data, where web clients will typically receive data as it comes in. So you might have to call several downstream services, accounts, maybe content, maybe product, assemble it all together and put it in one response. That's where it's nice to run asynchronous calls simultaneously. But in this case, we're just saying, okay, I want to hit one, I want to hit one API, get that response, send that on back. So there's no need to do asynchronous processing, which is why it's kind of funny where we're using this asynchronous stuff, but we are waiting for it to complete. And the reason is we're just making one call. So nonetheless, we'll say read string dot result. And I'm going to save that into a new variable. We'll call that JSON string. And then we can finally pass this in to our specimen.fromjson method that's going to take a raw JSON string and parse it into objects. Now, we need to make these specimens available to our CSHTML page, and I'm going to do this in a couple steps. I'm going to declare a list, which is a collection of data of the same type, declare it uh, type specimen, initialize it as empty, and then if we get inside of the if, if test, I'm going to reassign that variable to whatever we get back from this JSON parse. But by declaring it above the if test, if the if test fails for some reason, that is if we get an invalid HTTP response, the program will continue to run. It just won't have any results. Now down on line 38, I can, uh, well, let's, let me do it this way. 
if I introduce a local variable, take a look at the variable that the, the type that comes back. It's a list of specimens there on line 38, exactly like the list of specimens I have on line 33. But I want these to be one and the same. So instead of declaring a new variable, I'll simply assign a new value to the existing specimens variable. And finally, we know from a previous video, if we want to send data to a CSHTML page, we can use this view data collection, which is a conduit to send that data up to the CSHTML page, or even from one CSHTML page to another. So after the closed curly of the if test, I'll say view data, specimens equals specimens. And now we can take a look at the CSHTML and we can display our results. Right up here where we have the at symbol open curly close curly, we can grab that view data and assign it to a local variable. Now you notice a couple things. First of all, I have to qualify what this specimen is. Remember we put that in the namespace my plant diary, so I just need to add a using statement like so. Also, I need to be very specific that the data I'm getting back from view data is indeed a list of specimens, so I need to cast it. To cast it, I simply put the type that I am casting to uh, in parentheses. So here we have list specimen. Now we have our data available and we can put it into a table uh, right here on our page. Now to speed up the video just a little bit, I'm going to go ahead and type, I pause the video, type the HTML because it's just blah, a whole bunch of HTML. And then we'll insert what we need to show these specimens. Now you see I've created a table with the open and close table. I've created one row which represents the headings of that table, and then one area here that represents the data that we want to show in the table. But remember, we're going to want run one row for every specimen. So basically, we're going to want to iterate over our specimens. And within that loop, we want the segment where we're adding our row of data. Iteration, iterating is easy. I'll simply uh, indicate that I'm doing a little bit of code by doing and uh, at symbol and then open curly and at the end of this block where I have the TR I'm going to do a close curly. Now within here I'm going to say for each specimen, specimen, in specimens. Now what in the world is that? We have the world's word specimen all over here. Well recall that specimens is this repeating group of data and what we're saying is Let's iterate over this. In other words, let's shake hands with it, with everything that's inside of it. So we can only shake hands with one person at a time. Just like this collection, we can only shake hands with one specimen at a, at a time. So the specimen we're shaking hands with is in this variable called specimen here. And it's a variable of type specimen. So if that looks weird, each of those has a different purpose, and, and that's what it means. Let me tidy up just a little bit here. And now we can start filling in some data. If I want to refer to that specimen, the iteration variable, the one I'm shaking hands with, I simply use an at symbol. And it's going to follow our titles up here very well. That's that. Let's deploy and take a look. Looks pretty good to me. I see probably a couple hundred plant records here with plant ID, specimen ID, latitude, longitude, and address. Of course, I could pretty this up a little bit, make it a little bit more appealing, but uh, nonetheless, we see that it does work functionally. Now, we did several changes there, and so let's try again in the debugger. I've snapped a breakpoint, so all I have to do is refresh this page, and it will take us back to uh, Visual Studio. I put the breakpoint right where we started doing our work. So I'll press F10 to step over this line, which is going to create our task. And then we're going to ask the task for the result, which essentially is going to run the task and wait for that result. And we see that that's going to return a simple HTTP response. And notice when I mouse over it, we get a status code of 200. We know status code of 200 means good news, things went well. It's one of the well-defined HTTP status codes. Now we declare our list of specimens. We validate that we did get a successful status code. F10, F10 again. And now we need to read the string from that HTTP response. So once again, we start a task, and then we ask it for the result, which again says, okay, wait for it to complete and give me that result. Now that JSON string, let's mouse over this for a moment, because remember, this is a string. That's all it is, simple string. Um, so we're just looking at bits and bytes and commas and quotes and things like that. It's not actually a series of objects. 
line 38. Remember, that's where QuickType is. In QuickType is what changes that string from commas and curlies and square brackets and so on and so forth into an actual series of objects. So when I choose F10 here and we mouse over specimens, we see a little different look and feel than we saw with the string. We saw things that actually look like objects. You see we have an array here. Again, these are all the plants GPS at the Cincinnati Zoo. Although it's going back a few years, so some of these plants may have been replaced since then. But nonetheless, you see that we have good 166 or so plants, and each of them represented as an object. We can click. We'll see the same attributes, but we'll see different values for those attributes. When we're satisfied with this, I'll go ahead and choose F10. And we're going to take that specimen collection. Once again, it's the collection of 167 specimens, those objects we were just looking at. And now we'll choose F5, and it is going to render this page for us. And there we are. One small programming note. Uh, I, I noticed when I pasted in the quick type and I ran it for the first time, it tried to make a constant out of that address field, because in this case, the address of all of these plants is the same, the mailing address. 3400 Vine Street, Cincinnati, Ohio, 45220. So I try to make a constant out of that, but it caused a little trouble on parsing. So if you happen to use the same URL and you generate the QuickType client as I did, uh, this read JSON, I just had it, ret I, I made a little change here and I had it return this address all the time. Minor modification that you ha might happen to notice, but in general, if you take a JSON stream and you put it in a quick type, it does a pretty good job of generating that client. Only a couple times have I had to go down there and do some finagling. So, in any case, this has been a look at how to read a JSON stream into a C sharp razor page and display the data onto a web page to the user. As always, I hope this video has been helpful and I look forward to reading your comments. Thank you.